that you have to make a decision with an orange light. On a stop sign, you stop. If there's no sign, you go. But when there's a yield sign, you have to be sensitive about what you do. Because the yielding is impacted by what else is going on. And so when you think about that, what Paul is saying here, as he says in verse 12, don't let sin reign in your body. Now, right out of the shoot, what he's driving to us is this. Is that in order for me to make the right decision when it comes to decision time, there has to be some prerequisites in my life. If I Now, he's writing to the church, mind you. And he's telling the church they're wrong. You can't let sin have control of you. Because when sin has control of you, you're going to make bad decisions. Now, we all know in our life there are decisions that we have to make that are, uh, I don't know if temporal is the right word, not that necessarily impactful on our lives or even on the eternal realm of what we do as believers. But we also know there are a lot of decisions we have to make that we really have to pray. You know, I get a lot of prayer requests through the week. I get a lot of prayer requests on Sunday or on Wednesday night. And a lot of times I have prayer requests that are kind of to this nature. Pray with me. I'm praying about whatever it is. I got to make a decision about hmm, whether it's a job, whether it's a school, whether it's a, a, a relationship. I've got to make a decision about something. And the people that ask me know that that decision is going to make an eternal impact or spiritual impact in their lives and in their family. No matter what you do or where you go, the decisions you make are going to have an impact or an effect on you and your family. And so when Paul says, don't let this sin reign in your mortal body, what he's saying is, is when we have already given ourselves over to sin. Now, we know that we're all sinning. We know that we all make mistakes. But there's a difference between a believer making a mistake and a believer living in conscious sin. When a believer lives with sin in their life, they're opening up an opportunity to make some really bad decisions. Because that sin has a magnetism in it. And you begin to make your decisions around keeping that sin in its place. I, I heard old evangelist years ago call it your pet sin. Whatever your pet sin was. That, whatever that thing is that's closest to you in your heart that you know is wrong, but you can't turn loose of it because you don't think it's that bad and everybody else has got their thing and you think that's yours. That's your pet sin. When you let that sin have control over you, it's going to cause you to make some really bad decisions. So when Paul says that in verse 12, he's laying down a foundation for being able to do what he's talking about now in verse 13. Not yielding yourselves as instruments of unrighteousness. It's funny, Miss Lisa said what she said tonight about the election. It's funny what can come out of people uh, when stuff like that comes around. But the same thing happens in the church. When we talk about it on a political level, you talk about it on a church level. You vote on something as a church. You meet people at a business meeting, you don't even know which church with you. That show up and vote on something. One in particular, you vote to run the preacher off. <laughs> I've heard churches, they vote to run the preacher off, and the guy show up and vote him out. They never even knew he was his pastor. Just came because he liked the trouble. I had a friend one time. He pastored the church for seven months, and they had an all together hair pull. And when they did, they called it, and they had a, a business meeting, or they actually had a men's meeting to vote him out during the men's meeting, and then they were just going to go tell the church that we made a decision in the men's meeting to dismiss the pastor. And he showed up while they were going around making accusations at the pastor. The guy stood up and said, I was in the hospital for three days and I was sick as a dog. And you never called me. You never come saw me. You never checked on me one time. And Brother Nick stood up. Not Nick Andrews, another guy. But Brother Nick stood up and he said, for what it's worth, I never knew you existed. I've been here seven months and I didn't know you were alive. I didn't know that you were even a, a, a person. You've never been to church one time. I've never got one call from you. I never knew anything. Nobody in the church said that I needed to come see you. Nobody told me anything about you whatsoever. And so people are interested in creatures. And when sin has a root and a hope and an anchor in our life, it can pull us to make some bad decisions. Not everything that crosses my mind needs to be heard. You ought to see what crosses my mind. You said that man needs loud. Not everything that bubbles up inside of us needs to come out. We have filters to keep that stuff from always going. But the problem is, you still, when you got mad, you had to wait for you to see somebody to say it. And now when somebody gets mad, you, you can go straight to the internet and you can put anything anywhere and everybody gets to see it. I, I'll tell you this, it's funny, and it's so foreign to me, I've kind of got an old soul. You know, I was raised, my daddy's 80 years old. He was 44 when I was born. So I, I was raised kind of in the same mindset of a lot of people that are much older than me. And so 
when I hear stuff like Facebook fights and squabbles and stuff, it almost seems ignorant to me because it still seems so far, and even though we all don't look at that kind of stuff, it just seems like this is such a ridiculous thing for people to be fighting over and doing what they're doing. To put that kind of stuff on there. And I do. Some of the prayer requests that I get are people say, you know, did you see what so-and-so put on Facebook? Pray that God will help me talk to him about this. Talk to him about that. It's like you really just wish people would just grow up. Just be mature and hold back a little bit. You don't always have to pull the trigger. We live in a gotcha society. So it's all the way about getting somebody and getting ahead of somebody. And I got a little bit of that in me. I, I'm competitive by nature. And I, I just, you know what I mean, it's hard for me sometimes when I'm in that competitive mindset not to pull the trigger and say everything I want to say when somebody gives me an opportunity to win the argument or win the discussion. Sometimes you can win an argument and lose a friend. And you're better off just to keep your mouth shut. As a church sometimes, we can win the argument and lose a family. Win the argument and lose somebody that we love and we care for. Sometimes you're better off to stretch it out a little bit longer and give everything an opportunity to fall in place before you make an immediate knee-jerk reaction to anything. Especially with our mouths, can you hurt more people with your mouth than you can with your fists? <laughs> You know the old saying, sticks and stones break my bones, but words never hurt me. That's not true. Because your bones will heal up. Those bruises will go away. But what somebody says, they can't ever take it back. And I've dealt with people in marriage counseling. You know what it comes to? I, I, I've dealt with people in marriage counseling through the years. I have sat down and talked with couples that have been an absolute, unbelievable, physical abuse situation. And none of that would be the issue. The issue would be the, the, the abuse that was there emotionally, that they had been told for the entire marriage they were worthless, they were sorry, they were unfit, they were incapable, they weren't enough, that sick. That hurts people. And so when Paul talks about letting sin reign, when sin reigns, it's, it's here, here's the thing, if somebody up here thinks that they're enough, they'll take a ball bat and knock your brains out. Right? Y'all heard the story about Willie Nelson? Willie Nelson used to come home all liquored up and he'd whoop his wife. She sewed him up in a bed sheet one night and whooped him with a broom hammer. <laughs> See, if, if, if the emotional part's right, the physical part, you can endure it because you'll figure out because women know how to outsmart a guy. Just get him real full. Let him fall asleep in a chair somewhere. You got him. Right? Like the old Winston Churchill when the woman said, if you were my husband, I'd put arsenic in your tea. He said, honey, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. <laughs> I mean, there's a way, right? I'm not telling you to go and poison your husband. I'm just saying <laughs> that the emotional part sometimes is worse than the physical part. And when we have that, that sin nature, we let that sin nature take over, we'll be used as instruments, Paul says, of unrighteousness. We'll be used as vessels of unrighteousness. You know, think about a vessel. It's like this cup right here. You take that cup, and that cup's good for whatever you fill it up with. You fill that cup up with water, and not a lot of people in here fight over it. You fill that cup up with sweet dick. <laughs> There's some that run down here. But I, I'll, throw you, I'll throw you another sideboard. You fill that up with Miss Ruby Rogers' chicken and nothing? Huh? I'll be down here drop kicking people. <laughs> Whatever's in that cup is what determines the value of the cup. So when I yield myself as an instrument of unrighteousness, and I let myself be filled with something that God doesn't want in me, that I, I have devalued myself as a believer. I have now made myself less capable of being... A, a, a worthy advocate of doing what God has called me to do because I, I've been tainted. Brother Ross, you've got water here in this cup. I spit my cough drop in it while we were praying. I don't know if you saw that, but I did. It's ruined because of what I put in it. <laughs> Unless you like cough drop flavored water, second hand. Whatever you need to do. I don't have any, I don't have anything. I just like those flavored cough drops to keep my head open up while I pray. <laughs> so you might want to break, whatever. What you put in the cup determines the value of what's in there. When I, when I become an instrument of unrighteousness, what he's talking about, then I let sin reign in my body. I let sin reign in my life. And I let sin come out of me. I have to make a decision of what I'm going to be filled with. I have to make a decision how I'm going to be affected. I can get up on Sunday morning and say, I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to be a believer, and I'm going to worship Jesus. But if from Sunday night last week through Saturday night, I have done what he said in verse 12 and let sin reign in my mortal body. My worship's not going to be worth a whole lot. Even though Jesus will take it, right? I mean, he wants you to worship. But think how much you bring to the table in worship if you stay right through the week. If you try to do right. What do we say about faithfulness this morning? It's not about staying on the horse. It's about continuing to get back on the horse no matter how many times you fall. 
But when you let sin have the shadow in your life that overcome you and hold you back and keep you down, when that sin does that, that's I told you this morning, the devil don't want you to read the Bible. You know why he don't want you to read the Bible? Because he wants you to think when you mess up, you can't get back up. He wants you to think when you sin or make a mistake or do something you shouldn't do that you blew it and you didn't blow it. Maybe you did blow it, but that doesn't blow it for everybody because we've all blown it. <laughs> and what we need to do is just keep coming back, keep crawling back, and when you do that, it'll keep you humble before the Lord. Because your sin will remind you just how weak you are. But what it also does is it, it, it just completely engages you in worship. Because you know no matter how imperfect I am, no matter how wrong I have been, no matter how many mistakes I've ever made, God has never let go of me. He never quit loving me. He never quit blessing me. And so I'm just going to keep coming. Yield yourselves, or don't rather yield yourselves, to members of un uh, an instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Listen now. But yield yourselves unto God. So there's a decision that has to be made. Every day of my life I wake up and I have to decide what I'm going to do. And I, can I be honest with you tonight as a pastor? I don't wake up every morning and get me a cup of coffee and get my Bible and lay it out and say every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Some days I wake up and I don't feel like that. Y'all finna have one of them preacher fucking meetings. <laughs> Some days I wake up with a headache. Some days I wake up, I don't feel good. Some days I wake up and I, and I don't know what it was from the day before, or the week before, or the month before, something that you've heard. It drives you crazy. It wears on you. It burdens your heart. And you don't wake up with that fire and that, that, that overwhelming desire. But here's what I've learned. The days that I want it the least are the days I need it the most. And if I can, that day, if I can, as the Bible says, wrestle myself into submission and make the devil see that I'm going to yield myself to the Lord. God's going to help me that day. And I'm going to have victory that day. When I realize that my life is not my own. So it's not mine to, to go blow. It's not mine to go fulfill. It's just in the hands of the Lord. And when I see it, he says, don't yield myself to unrighteousness, but yield myself to God. When you come to that yield sign, you have to make a decision. I'm either going to slow down and stop, or I'm going to get up and go. One of the two. But whatever decision you make is determined by what else is going on. And so whatever's going on in your life, if you can come to the place that you see that I need to not yield necessarily to traffic, but I need to yield to the Lord. Because our life is kind of like that on ramp and off ramp. God kind of like the freeway. You can either get in or, or get out, right? And if I want to do what God wants me to do, I gotta, I've got to yield to Him. I've got to find my place and I've got to get in. And that's what he's talking about here. Yielding ourselves, as he says, unto God as those that are alive from the dead. You know, we talked about this morning in, the, in this thought process of being faithful and the faithfulness that we should all desire in our life about how we need to remember what he's done for us. We do need to remember what he's done for us. Having remembered what he's done for us, we need to remember what we are because of that. I was a person in sin Lost, and as the Bible says, dead, without life, without any hope for eternal life. I was, I was defeated, and I had no way out. You know, a song that we've been singing for years, and I'd be all right with it if we sing it for years and years to come. Victory in Jesus. There's a line, my Savior, forever. When you grasp a hold of the fact, I was dead, I was lost, I was, I was undone, I was without hope. I was without help, and Jesus saved me. Jesus brought me victory. And now, not only am I saved, am I free, but I have life and life eternal. Jesus said, a thief comes but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. I preached last Sunday night a message that I preached here a couple of months ago about the excellency of Christ in John 8, when they bring the woman cast down before the Lord, and Jesus writes in the sand, and the men have to file out one by one, and then he forgives the lady and she walks away. And his next statement there in John 8, 12, as he looks to that congregation of people that's now full of questions about what just happened, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness. He'll have that light of life living in him. When the light of the world has spoken life into you, you'll never be the same. You'll never again wonder what it's like to have that touch and that light and that life in you. And so when Paul says, let's, let's, basically Paul said, let's live like we're alive. 
Let's yield ourselves to the Lord and yield ourselves to God as those that are alive and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So before the instrument, before the vessel can be filled with what's right and used to do what's right, there has to be a decision that's made. And that decision is to yield. We went to Omaha, Nebraska a couple years ago. Me and Jacob went down. They had a, what they call a splash pad, like a water park type thing built into the bottom level of the hotel. And they had this big old bucket, and it was shaped like a V almost. It had a narrow bottom and a wide top, uh, and it was on this spindle. And it had water pouring into it. And once it got to a certain level in that thing, the top outweighed the bottom, and it was no, I bet it, I don't know, it was, it was way more than 55 gallons of water. And it would just pour over. It would just pour over. Now, the interesting thing was, is the way that that thing tilted, the way that that thing spilled out, was determined by the weight of what was in it and the way you let that thing lead. See, in our lives, a lot of times, the way you go is going to be because of the way that you, the way that you lean. If I lean towards the Lord, I'm a lot more apt for what's doing right to come in and pull me that way. But if I lean towards sin, I'm a lot more apt for what's going that way to come grab me and make me lean that way. Because once I'm shifted this way, if there's something pulling me this way, it's harder to go back that way. But if I lean this way, it's harder to go that way. So when Paul says that we don't yield ourselves as members of unrighteousness, but we yield ourselves unto God, that means I have to lean. You know, when you yield, you, you're coming in. And when I yield the right direction, then when the opportunity comes to be filled with the things of righteousness, then when the opportunity comes, as he says, to be an instrument of righteousness, then it, it becomes a lot easier for me because I don't have to then correct my bad yielding. I don't have to correct leaning in that wrong direction, trying to go that wrong way. I'm already trying to lean the right way, so when the opportunity comes to be filled with righteousness, I'm there. So that God can pour into me and that God can use me. We all want to be an instrument. Did y'all see that we got a new drum? We got a new drum today? That brother Kyle been a blessing playing the drum for me. Yeah, I taught, he stayed for three weeks. I taught him how to play the drum. They joined the church and look at what the Lord's doing for him. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, they have a drum. So, that moment, if anybody want to play anything, let us know. We'll get it. I need to go to harmonica or whatever. So, you come on. The thing about that drum, it wouldn't be near as neat if it only had one part. That piano wouldn't be near as pretty if it only had one key. That guitar wouldn't be near as nice if the truck didn't have but one string. He'd be over there just plucking, boom, 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 like a big old bass with one string on it. But when you put those six strings together, how many keys on the piano? You put all them, all them keys on the piano. Give me a minute, I'll go count. When you put all those different pieces together in the drum, all they're different. Ross looked at it this morning and said, I know he loves it. He only had two cymbals with the other one. I said, I'm so embarrassed. I've never noticed that. Right? I didn't know. Who knows how many cymbals are on one But I know this. The more instruments you put together, the better the sound. I love to hear a good soloist, but is there anything better than harmony? Because when there's good harmony, that means there's more people involved. And you can take this town and that town. Listen, I love a good football game. But it takes 11 men to get out there and do the part. And it don't matter how good a running back you are, you don't have somebody blocking for you. No matter how good you can throw it, if there's not somebody to catch it. No matter how good you can catch it, if there's not somebody to throw it. So it takes everybody to put all this together and perform Properly. And so as a church, what Paul is saying is as we yield ourselves as instruments to righteousness, we have a chance to shine brighter, to go further, and to be better. Because no matter what the devil has told you, we need every one of you. And we need everybody in here, not just to be here, not just to be dead weight. He used to say, hold down a pew, and now to hold down a folding chair, right? <laughs> but we don't need you just to be here. We need everybody in our church, in our church. And the reason that we want more people it's because we want more people to bring more talent, more ability, more gifts, more of the presence of God through their life to serve and worship God. So that everybody in here, if we'll all yield, if we all, if we all must lean, right? And we'll all lean towards God. When that righteousness comes, and when He needs an instrument to use for His glory, there'll be more availability. And as there's more availability, there'll be more people engaged. And as more people get engaged, we'll be able to accomplish more for the glory of God. If we all yielded here this morning, not to unrighteousness, not to sin, but if we dealt with our sin, dealt with that, that decision, that internal decision, that I've got to yield one way or the other, 
And what Paul's kind of suggested here is that if you don't yield to righteousness, you're yielding to unrighteousness. If you don't yield to God, you're yielding to sin. James said, for a man to do good and do it not, it's a sin unto him. So even when I don't do right, I might not necessarily be doing any egregious, bad, awful things, but if I'm not doing right, I'm still not doing anything. So Paul said, yield yourselves to God. Don't, don't yield yourselves as members of unrighteousness, but yield yourselves to God so that you can be used, as he says there, uh, as, as people who are alive from the dead, so that we can be used as instruments of righteousness unto the Lord. Y'all stand with me. Father, we love you tonight. God, we thank you for your word. We pray this evening that this message will stick in our heart. Pray, God, that we'll have a desire to lean the right direction. Knowing, God, that we can't do this by ourselves. But I pray we'll lean into you. I pray that we would, we would cautiously yield to the right things. Leaning towards you. Leaning for you. So that we can be instruments of righteousness. So that people can see us full of Jesus. Lord, we've got to be empty of our other things. We've got to let this stuff go. We can't let sin reign in our moral body. But God, we've got to lean toward you. So I pray we get our hearts right. I pray we lean toward you. And that you use us for your honor and glory. Bless our invitation tonight. Maybe there's somebody here that needs to be saved. Maybe there's somebody here that needs to get something settled. Whatever the case may be, I pray you help us. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that i got sin in my life. I need to deal with it. So that I can yield to God. Whoever, whatever, it is my privilege, God, tonight to know there's not a need in this place you can't be. With that confidence, we pray, God, that you'd open this altar tonight to our hearts. And that any that feel that they might need to come will know that they can. That they're welcome here. And that you'll be here to hear them, receive them, and do what you can in their life. Bless our invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.